<laughs> um, I'm Chris Duffy. I have uh, dark hair and a uh, dark beard. I'm wearing a black shirt. And uh, I'm Fanchon Cox, and I am a light-skinned black woman with curly, short curly hair and an olive top. So welcome to Hollywood's Footprint Workshop. We are live at the Hollywood Climate Summit presented by Netflix and NYU Los Angeles. This session is made possible by the British Film Commission, and we have an incredible lineup of speakers for you today. Uh, first, I would love to introduce my co-host and co-moderator, Fanchon Cox, the president of True Jolo Productions. Um, True Jolo uplifts stories that speak truth in pursuit of justice in service of love. Fanchon is a development and producing executive at Matt Damon and Ben Affleck's Pearl Street Films and a co-author of The Inclusion Writer. She's the co-host of the Webby-nominated podcast, Sista Brunch, highlighting Black women thriving in entertainment and media. Thank you so much, Chris. It is such a pleasure to be here. I am learning right, around, right along with all of you and constantly working to do better in this. Um, but Chris, you have an amazing bio too. For those who don't know the great work that Chris does yet, he is a comedian, television writer, and radio podcast host. He also currently hosts Ted's How to Be a Better Human podcast, which is really what we're all here for. Um, and he wrote for both seasons of Wyatt Cenac's Problem Areas on HBO, executive produced by John Oliver. Chris is both a former fifth grade teacher and a former fifth grade student. Chris, I'm also a former fifth grade student, so this is just another thing that we have in common. I love that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Fenton. It's truly an honor to be here with you. Um, are you ready to learn about some science and policy in a way that is absolutely not boring? I am so ready for this. So uh, today's Great. panel, yeah, let's do this. Today's panel, so you all know, will focus on three main subject areas, environmental footprint, cultural footprint, and then we're going to discuss solutions that anybody who's watching can apply to their work. And the beautiful and the beautiful part about this uh, panel being online is we really want you to be involved. So we are seeing your comments. If you have questions, if you have ideas, we want to get you involved. And we're definitely going to uh, be highlighting those throughout the show. Um, but before we introduce our amazing panelists, we have a message from our friend, comedian and rapper Dave Bird, aka Little Dicky, who's going to help us understand what we refer to as a carbon footprint and provide a few tips on how we can reduce ours. Everybody, Dave Bird, Little Dicky here, rapper, actor, a bunch of other things that I don't need to bore you with. I'm here with the Hollywood Climate Summit to explain some scientific terms about climate change and the climate crisis that might be like foreign to you. It can be confusing. I remember when I was first understanding what was happening, everyone was saying these things and I truly had no idea what anybody was talking about. Maybe I can help uh, with the jargon, you know? Luckily, the Hollywood Climate Summit team has given me some flashcards, things to go over with you. For example, carbon footprint. I hear a train going by right now. It's got carbon footprint written all over it. What does it mean? Uh, it's the total amount of the Earth's greenhouse gas emissions. That might be confusing in itself. The Earth's greenhouse gases, what they do is they trap heat in the atmosphere that warm the planet. The main gas is responsible for the greenhouse effect are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. What creates greenhouse gases, you might ask? Cows, primarily. Who would have known cows like actually farting and shitting creates so much greenhouse gases? Actually, in the last century, human activities such as burning fossil fuels and deforestation have caused a jump in concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. The result is the extra heat has been trapped and that's causing the earth to warm at a uh, not ideal rate. There have been reports, reports, important reports that are kind of harrowing, which means scary and uh, foreboding. That's not one of the words they gave me to define, uh, but I don't even know if I'm funny anymore. I'm kind of losing my sense of self. What did those reports say? We are on pace to heat the world by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040, even if humanity cuts carbon pollution as quickly as possible. That means like Miami floods. That means like fires are all over burning everything. This is such a major issue that I'm not sure people realize like how real it is. If we don't prevent the earth from warming less than 1.5 degrees Celsius, we are gonna fuck it all up. So we need to like really start this plan now because it's gonna be irreversible. How can we lower our carbon footprint as individuals? We could eat less meat, cows, big reason for carbon emissions. We all just like ate those impossible burgers. The world 
could be saved, maybe. I'm just not educated enough on the meats. I'm not saying don't ever eat a steak ever again, but just cut it down. We could actually save the earth. We could also uh, lower our carbon footprint by reconsidering how much and how often we travel. You know, I'm looking at you, Hollywood. You know, there's all these casual set visits from executives and people moving and shaking and meeting and greeting to network. Only travel when it's necessary. All that gas and shit that the plane spills out of its ass, that's not good. I'm not saying don't I'm gonna be on a plane, I travel. I'm just saying only do it when you need to. Stop living so selfishly. Movie makers, you know, you should know that according to the Screen New Deal report, the average tentpole film creates 28 hundred at least tons of greenhouse gas emissions that's the equivalent of a carbon impact of 11 one-way trips from earth to the moon there are so many ways that we can lower that carbon footprint as hollywood as people this is what this summit's all about we're going to find out ways we're going to do it together i like that you're tuned in i like that you care about this let's actually take that care and apply it to action visit the link on the screen to join me in taking action right now i know the facts are scary i hope they scared you i hope that you're scared by these facts so let's get ready to work let's chit chat with uh humanity about how we're gonna save this earth thank you very much all right thank you dave thank you little dicky um, so now that we've uh, established a little bit of the terms, the science behind the scenes, uh, let's get into let's get into it with our distinguished panelists. Let's have some of the real science here, um, and let's begin welcoming Emma Stewart, PhD, who is the Netflix sustainability officer. Um, she's responsible for the company's climate and environmental strategy and execution. She previously led the World Resource Institute's global work on urban efficiency climate and finance, and she holds a PhD in environmental science and management from Stanford and a BA honors degree in human resources, in human sciences from Oxford University. We've also got Louise Marie Smith. She's the sustainability officer for the British Film Commission, regional sustainability advisor for Netflix and founder and managing director of Neptune Environmental Solutions. She's got 18 years of experience implementing environmental management systems within a variety of industries with the past eight years being focused specifically on film and TV, y'all, that's us including, so listen, we don't want to hear any excuses because she worked on large productions such as Jurassic World. We know if y'all can do the work on that, we can do it on everything. Yeah, we have, and we just keep adding more incredible panelists. Let's welcome Aruzer Canela Mas. She joined BAFTA's Albert five years ago and has been advising productions on how to lessen their carbon footprint and environmental impact since then. Uh, she currently manages all of Albert's international relationships and has built the newest version of the Albert Toolkit, which is a carbon calculator and carbon action plan. And coming to us live from New York City, we've got Stephanie Dawson, who's the co-chair of the PGA, the Producers Guild of America East Green Committee, a founding member also of Women Independent Producers and a climate reality leader. Dawson is currently a producer for WNET Group for the PBS show Great Performances. Uh, her independent film credits include Down with the King, which won grand prize at Deauville American Film Festival earlier this month. Congrats, sister. And Maya and Her Lover, which will screen at the American Black Film Festival this fall. She's also worked in unscripted and branded content for such companies as Courageous Studio, Va uh, Vayner Media, Inception Creative, and Golden Arm. And all of these bios are also going to be up on the website, so you can get even deeper into their work if you're uh, if you're missing it when we're saying it out loud. But last but not least, Hunter Vaughn is an environmental media scholar and cultural historian at the University of Cambridge focusing on the relationship between screen media technologies, social justice, and the environment. His most recent book, Hollywood's Dirtiest Secret, The Hidden Environmental Costs of the Movies, offers an environmental counter-narrative to the history of mainstream film culture and explores the environmental ramifications of the recent transition to digital technologies and practices. So we're going to talk right. a lot more about all of that today. Fanchen, why don't you get us started? Yeah, let's get started. So our first question in the environmental footprint block for today is for Emma. Um, Emma, earlier this year, Netflix announced its net zero plus nature plan uh, to eliminate its greenhouse gas emissions by 
the end of 2022. Huge congrats on that. You're being very transparent about the steps you intend to take to get there. Uh, number one, reduce emissions. Number two, retain existing carbon storage. And number three, remove carbon from the atmosphere. So where are you all currently in that process? And can you also just break this down for anybody who's watching who is like, what is all of this science about, please? Absolutely, it's such a pleasure. Thank you, Fanton. I have worked as a scientist in uh, countries like Mexico and Kenya, uh, Brazil. So I've witnessed firsthand how nature uh, has for millennia stabilized the climate and more recently provided us free of charge, largely, uh, life support systems. And so as we heard earlier today, what we know now from the science is that all of these life support systems are at risk and humanity and, and really the quality of our life um, and the equity of our society is also put at risk if our temperatures rise beyond this 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold, beyond which we start to see what's called runaway climate change. So Netflix got ourselves organized. I joined the company in October and six months later, we publicly announced this net zero by next year goal. And as you rightly said, we use these three R's. Some of you will remember that old adage of reduce, reuse, recycle. Well, this is the modern version for the modern challenge, which is climate change. So we've set ourselves on a science-based trajectory for these internal reductions. That translates to about a 45% absolute reduction in a growing company by 2030. Then in addition to that, for emissions that we ourselves can't reduce in any given year, and these are largely in our supply chain, we will invest in carbon credits that retain uh, carbon in soils, uh, in mangroves, in grasslands. And we are also buying carbon credits that actively remove carbon from the atmosphere. And we really feel that nature has proven herself a very uh, uh, effective technology, kind of the original technology, if you will. And so that's where we're putting much of our emphasis um, in the near term. And what we announced yesterday is our in-progress report. We call it an in-progress report because this is obviously a journey as to what we've accomplished so far. And we're quite pleased to announce that we've started reducing our electricity consumption through energy efficiency audits across a lot of our uh, facilities. We are decarbonizing our electricity supply by enrolling our offices and facilities in green tariff programs where they're available and where they're not available, buying uh, renewable electricity through what are called renewable energy credits. We've also been piloting some really cool uh, clean and silent power for productions. One example is on the Bridgerton set, we were able to switch off a number of diesel generators by swapping them out for what's called a hydrogen fuel cell and this was using uh, green hydrogen. And the crew, first of all, uh, loved that it was silent. They also loved that the only effluent, the only pollutant coming out of this fuel cell is clean water from which they made coffee. I was hoping they would make tea because they're in the UK, but they made coffee. And uh, I, I found that that was really quite charming. We've also purchased uh, over a million tons of carbon credits to protect and restore critical habitats received third-party validation of our science-based target, and we've publicly advocated for climate policy, namely that the G20 countries step up on their national cl climate targets in advance of the COP26, and that the US uh, Congress pass the climate provisions currently drafted in the budget reconciliation bill. So we've been busy, and we really are, are, are enjoying working with our partners across the entertainment sector to transform this industry. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, and uh, I would just like to say, I see there's some uh, discussion in the chat going on about carbon footprint. And we're actually gonna talk about three sections. So first is environmental footprint. Then we are gonna go on to cultural footprint. And then we're gonna talk about solutions. And um, I just wanna say, I share some of the skepticism around the individual carbon footprint. But what's great is we have people here who represent big organizations and are in positions of power. So we're really workshopping it in, in a larger frame than just the individual idea. So actually that transitions perfectly to this question that we have for you, Louise, which is you're a film producer. You work with studios and crews worldwide. So when you are measuring a production's environmental footprint, what's most important to you? And, and how does that impact differ on a major budget film or TV show versus a medium or small budget one? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, 
I'm Louise, I am Caucasian female, I have long straight brown hair and I am sitting next to a pile of unread books. Um, <laughs> so moving on to your question, um, what I find most important about footprinting. So I think um, it might not be that well known, but for quite some time through the Green Production Guide or Albert, which is a UK version, um, film and television have largely been been counting their carbon footprint. And so there's quite a lot of data that we have now that we're able to look at um, what's what's the average for a temple feature, what's the average for a one hour drama, what's the average for a, a natural history show, for example. And with that data, what we're able to do is look at where the impacts come from. So that's what's important to us when we're trying to reduce the footprint is if we know what percentage comes from our electricity use, our fuel use for power generation, our ground transportation or our flights, we can use that information and put our energies in the right place to really kind of bring that footprint down or to, as Emma was just mentioning about the hydrogen fuel cells, to look at new technologies to replace the more um, polluting diesel generators that we, that we had in the past. Uh, as far as the difference between a large scale kind of feature or, or something smaller, the, there's not a huge difference, to be honest. It, it's all just kind of economy of scale. So I, I think perhaps smaller productions do tend to be more efficient um, just in general because they have to be. They need to be a bit leaner due to their budgets. So you, you see a lot less waste um, in, in that sense. You know, they're not going to leave a diesel generator running and and, and run that fuel down that's costing money. Um, that, that They might have a bit more foresight from the financial perspective. But really, it is kind of very much similar across the board, I would say. Thank you so much. I love that you talked about kind of collecting and analyzing data, because as we get into the solutions portion, I know that's going to be an important part of what we talk about. We've kind of got to know what the numbers look like to think about really where the solutions make the most sense. Our next question is for Ruzer. Uh, while working for Albert at BAFTA, you spearheaded its carbon calculator. How do carbon calculators work? And um, tell us about their evolution and also what progress and investments need to be made. Please. OK, hi, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a ca uh, Caucasian white a woman with uh, dark, long hair and wearing a blue navy, blue navy jacket. Uh, so yeah, thank you for, for inviting me here. So basically, in terms of carbon calculators, so we just, in January, we just released our latest, uh, latest update, latest version. But that's the third version that that we that we launch, and so how we started. So we started ten years ago uh, through the BBC. So the BBC created the carbon calculator because they wanted to understand the environmental impact of their of their productions. But for you to understand how it has evolved, so the first carbon calculator was just a spreadsheet where people was putting data, and that was it. So obviously we had to move that online. And with the years, we have been evolving in terms of introducing more car more emission factors and more data to be included. Um, let's go into another side. First of all, I want to I wanna agree with Emma and, and with Luis as well that obviously you need to, unless you know your impact, so we keep talking about reducing our impact, but how are we going to make a strategy to reduce our impact if we don't know our impact? And I think that's what the industry really needs to learn. So we need to learn what our biggest impacts are so we can we can reduce it. Yeah, so that's that's the start. So when we started carbon calculators for us were more an education tool. So an education tool to the industry, because obviously, as Luis mentioned as well, it really differs from the budget. So we really look at the correlation between uh, budget and carbon footprint. So obviously, if you have if you have a small budget, your carbon footprint is gonna is gonna be bigger, uh, it's gonna be smaller. So but that's something that we kind of assume, but if we don't see it with the numbers on our faces, we don't we don't do anything. So first of all, we start more about educating. So educating people on which data they needed to collect, how they needed to collect it, and what that meant. There is important to have live carbon calculators so that when someone introduces data, they can see how their carbon footprint goes up and how much it goes up. So again, to educate them, yeah. Um, so how they work in the back end, so I don't know if people here knows, but everything that we do in our lives uh, has a, an emission an emission factor attached to it. So obviously every everything that I'm wearing, everything that I do have has a carbon a carbon 
a carbon footprint attached to it. So that's what we build behind. So we put a number, a CO2, uh, a CO2 release into the atmosphere number to everything that we do in production. Yeah. And again, so we make we make people uh, collect the data manually and put it manually so they understand that every action that they do in their production has an impact. And on this new calculator, the new things that we included basically is that now we have um, we have international carbon factors. So obviously generating electricity in Spain or in the UK or in the US in different states has a different impact because of the way that is generated. So that's something that is really important that we acknowledge. So it depends where we're filming and depends like which if we're using grid or we're not using grid, we have a different, a different impact. Uh, and the way how they are evolving, I believe so. Again, we started being more educating. So, okay, all the production teams, they needed to understand which data they needed to collect and how was that affecting their carbon footprint. However, as, as soon as we move on, what we see now is because obviously companies want to report on their carbon footprint. There are, uh, go there are government targets, legally binding uh, targets that governments are, are setting. So obviously companies are going to be obligated to calculate their carbon footprint and they're going to be obligated to report on them. So it's really important that calculators keep being relevant. They keep being ambitious. Obviously we collect as much data as we can and they keep being relevant. So it's important the kind of reporting that we present and it's important that this data collection, it's really easy and doable for production. So obviously we're starting to see conversations on how can we pull uh, the information, the data that we have from a financial system, for example, or from another software in order to bring it to the calculator. And that's going to translate that into a, into a CO2, into a CO2 emissions. But obviously there has been a big involvement in terms of starting educating. So starting while small, starting, you need to be in front of the calculator and understand what we're measuring. And now we're moving to a more automatic phase. Um, where you can see the data just pulling over and seeing better reports that they comply with the greenhouse gas protocols as well. So obviously uh, productions that are huge and extremely well funded, they have lots of choices about how they do things. But uh, for some of the independent productions, they don't always have those choices. And, and Stephanie, you have been an independent producer yourself. You also at PJ Green, you work with a lot of independent producers. How do you think that smaller productions can scale sustainable solutions and be more aware of their own footprint? Thank you for having me. I am a black woman with curly salt and pepper hair and glasses, and my shirt says "Empower and Inspire." I wrote that. I wore that specifically for today. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great question. I mean, uh, I, I appreciate um, the the idea that a smaller production will have a smaller footprint simply because of its size. But I think also when we're working with indies, we tend to don't have we don't have the time to really build in a lot of the planning that is necessary to. Uh, make sure that our production is sustainable. Uh, we have a lot of people who are working maybe uh, at a higher level than they have in the past, so they don't have all the experience and contacts that maybe a more experienced or larger production would have. And 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 they're also it's a time crunch. A lot of times when you're kind of against the gun, it's just like let's just order it. We're just gonna we're just gonna ship it in. So um, so a lot of the things that independent productions can really do is I I always say uh, start with intention because. Um, in an independent production, we don't have a studio, we don't have a uh, foundation, some kind of financial um, entity that's encouraging or mandating that we uh, implement some kind of sustainable practice. So it is really top down. So the first thing is to start with intention. And that usually comes from the top. Um, I have been on productions where the director has said, I want to have a green production. And because uh, that person set that intention and communicated communicated it to everyone we all realize that we want to do and as the production progresses we know we want to have a, a clean and um, sustainable production because our director has has set it forth same thing with the when the producer says it it really helps to have that top-down um, kind of drive because then everyone knows this is we're encouraging everyone to kind of march kind of in the same direction um, the next piece um, I think Emma may have said about reduce, reuse, recycle. It's an old adage, but it, it totally applies. Um, with indie, 
indie productions, we can reduce our footprint. We can reduce the number of vehicles that we have. A lot of times we don't have the money for trailers anyway. So we, uh, in our holding spaces, we move in hair and makeup and wardrobe and things of that nature. So we don't have trucks and, and things idling outside. Um, other things we can do, we can reduce our catering footprint. Um, even on Indies, sometimes we have those nice lavish uh, catering setups that have a lot of food that goes to waste, honestly, at the end of the uh, meal. So having built in, either built in um, ways that we can donate the food as long as it's kept at the right temperature and packaged properly. Even in COVID, we can still donate food to those who need it. Um, but reducing that uh, footprint initially, not having th these lavish um, uh uh, um, catering setups. Another thing we can do is the opt-in system where we we have, traditionally we opt uh, to have more meat dishes. We um, A lot of times we veer toward chicken because everybody likes, you know, chicken is something that a lot of people can, can adapt to. But if we have a more vegetarian focused meal and then the opt-in are the meat options, that's another way that we can reduce our footprint and so avoid beef dishes entirely, as, as Little Dickie talked about all the cows um, adding to the uh, greenhouse gases. And then having meat be either fewer times a week or be the option in. Uh, another thing uh, in the earlier clip about the um, hotline, someone mentioned we're still printing scripts. So we can look at all the things that need to be distributed between scripts and schedules and um, just any kind of paperwork, the, the onboarding paperwork. A lot of that can be moved online. One of the things we found out during COVID is we can onboard people uh, completely digitally. And so let's maintain that and let's have the opt in. If someone needs a printed script, they need to request it specifically. So there, there's some very concrete things that even indies can do um, that can make a difference. And, you know, it's not about tackling everything all at once. It's about doing the things that we can do and then implementing that on this production. And then as we move on to the next production, we implement more processes. So um, I think indies can, can really start making these strides. The other thing I would say is that a lot of folks start in indie production and they may move to a higher budget uh, production. So if we can implement and, and start making these practices become uh, commonplace in your earlier uh, positions, you can bring them to the larger productions. You can, they can be commonplace and they can be the, the standard once you move to uh, a different kind of production. Awesome, Stephanie, thank you so much. I love knowing that the Producers Guild is really committed to this um, because obviously producers have so much say in terms of what happens on set. So it makes so much sense for things to really start there. Uh, Hunter, we're gonna move to you. Thank you for specifically writing a book for Hollywood to understand what our impact is. So in the book, you oscillate between the social power that screen culture wields and, it's also, and also its profound environmental ramifications, including the raw materials tech industries rely on to sustain to today's popular content demand. So how large is the big picture when it comes to Hollywood's environmental footprint? Let's all get ready for this truth right now. Um, thanks, Fanchon, and thanks everyone for, for being here and for, for having me on board. Um, it is both really large and also really, really difficult uh, to calculate and, and to map. I think that, you know, Stephanie just gave some really great insights into the, the broad range of ways in which uh, just a film production can have environmental ramifications, uh, whether it has to do with, you know, catering choices or production techniques or the size of a production crew. Um, the actual impacts and, and ramifications of film culture has changed a lot over time. And with different sort of organizational structures uh, of the screen culture industry. Um, and so, for example, you know, early classical Hollywood had massive impacts on Southern California through the construction of studios. And a lot of that was sort of contained uh, within that area. The studios had their own water systems. They basically took over their own natural resource uh, management. Um, then uh, gradually moved into more of a culture of one runaway productions. And so today we see a lot of mobile productions and the history of that has been very intrusive and disruptive for local e ecosystems um, as well as for, for local marginalized social groups, which I think we'll, we'll get to talk about a bit more uh, later. Um, so, you know, there's a, a, a lot to 
take into consideration uh, regarding the life cycle and the materiality of, of film production. And it starts long before production. It starts, you know, in development. Uh, it starts with location scouting and travel. There's so many sort of different cogs in the machinery. Um, and this also involves, as you mentioned, uh, Fanchen, the, the sort of technological materiality uh, that, that underpins uh, screen culture. And going back to like analog film, you know, um, this all began with the manufacturing of film stock. You know, films were not possible without the, the raw material of film stock that was churned out, especially of the, the Kodak plant in Rochester, New York, uh, through a very uh, pollutant process, which actually rendered Rochester the most carcinogenic city in the US. Uh, this extends from, you know, from the manufacturing of film stock to the actual disruptions of production itself and on to through the sort of excesses of, of red carpet culture and things like that. And now uh, does, as uh, to go back to your question, you know, it, it, it now plays a massive role in the connection to a digital infrastructure uh, and a sort of 21st century um, culture of, of server dependency and digital distribution that's deeply tied to the rapidly uh, proliferating infrastructures of ICT, uh, as well as the resource intensity and the energy dependency of sort of constantly um, maintained 24 seven, uh, seven server culture. And so it is, again, you know, it's, it's massive, but part of the massiveness is because film culture is deeply enmeshed in a much wider network of cultural practices and, and industry uh, and industry practices. And it has a very complicated life cycle. So it's very difficult to, to pin down, to calculate and, and to map out exactly where these issues lie the most heavily. And so that is something that, you know, hopefully, uh, scholarly research and onset practice and you know policy formation uh, can can do together. Thank you so much, Hunter, and uh, thank you to everyone for uh, answers in that that section. We are we're now going to transition from behind the scenes to in front of the camera. So that was the environmental footprint. Now let's talk about the cultural footprint of our industry. And I know that people have already been bringing this up in the chat, right? I saw Xander mentioned something about the power that. Hollywood has to, to make cultural change. And, and we talked before this panel began, we talked about um, the ways in which Hollywood has done that in the past, for example, with cigarettes and making sure that like smoking wasn't promoted on camera anymore. So Louise, let's start with you. How, how much of the work that you're doing behind the scenes should also be done in front of the camera, right? When it comes to transportation, energy, housing, in what ways could we be seeing environmental solutions on screen? Absolutely, yeah, it's really important. I think. The main crux of it is that we want to model sustainable behavior as aspirational to our audience so that they want to emulate it, right? Everybody wants to kind of emulate the, the lead character, the star in a movie. So if, if we're modeling sustainable behavior as something that they want to, to copy, we've got this huge footprint with our audience. Um, so I think that's something that we're, we're gradually starting to learn and incorporate. So from the writing, perspective it might be that you have a character stop eating beef or go vegan and discuss that the reason that they're doing that is to, to reduce their carbon footprint they might purchase an electric vehicle um and, and again bring that into kind of their reasoning behind it being that they're climate conscious um and again we can we can work um behind the scenes so i will always meet with and discuss with our set deck and props departments what what is in people's homes and offices when we're showing them on screen so it might be subtle and kind of subliminal that we literally just have in a character's kitchen they've got the little caddy to compost their food waste or they ride a bike to work or you know that there might be signage in an office setting for something to do with recycling or climate consciousness or, or something like that so there there are so many kind of different ways that we can incorporate sustainability on screen some quite overt some quite subliminal but they're they're all important because as much as we can impact the the how of many hundred crew members might be on that production and what we're doing on the day to day millions of people see the product that we produce on screen and that is a really really huge impact that we we can and should have oh 
I love those ideas so much. Um, I'm already thinking as a development executive how I'm going to implement those and everything that we develop out of Pearl Street. Um, so our next question is for Emma. Um, obviously, the biggest strength of the entertainment industry is its storytelling power. So from your experience, how can storytelling be a catalyst for climate action? And is this also part of the work that Netflix is doing already? Well, I'll start off with one of my favorite quotes, which comes from a conservation scientist named uh, Peter Kariba. And he likes to say, science tells us what to do, but it's storytelling that makes us want to do it. So just as Louise yes. was saying, <laughs> it's a good one, right? I love that. And, and we love that people come to Netflix for the incredible stories that are told by our creative partners. And of course, climate change is the epic story of our day. It's one that creators are already telling uh, at Netflix and elsewhere while we work to make the act of storytelling uh, more sustainable. So we were delighted to find that in 2020 alone, 160 million households around the world chose to watch at least one green premise title on Netflix. And these are titles that overtly talk about environmental themes or raise environmental awareness. These are titles like the award-winning uh, series, Our Planet, that deepen our appreciation for our, our home planet, our, our only planet, um, or My Octopus Teacher, which walked away with an Oscar and is about the deep connection between humankind and other living creatures, in that case, uh, an octopus. In June, we released a documentary called Breaking Boundaries, which features Dr. Johan Rockström, who we affectionately call Johan Rockstar, now that uh, his film, which is narrated by Sir David Attenborough, was handpicked by President Joe Biden and Secretary John Kerry to be shown to 40 world leaders in April at Biden's uh, Leaders Climate Summit. It was also endorsed through a letter by 100 Nobel laureates uh, the following month. And then Sir David Attenborough has used pieces of it at his G7 keynote uh, in June. But these are not exclusive to documentaries. This really applies to all genres. So you may see uh, dramas. Like if you haven't seen Ragnarok, the series about uh, Norse mythology and the intersection with climate change, you must, you must take the time to see that. If you haven't seen IO, Last on Earth, it's incredibly touching. Or The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, one of my favorite both books and films. We also see our creators telling fun docu-series about solutions, sustainability solutions, like uh, Down to Earth with Zac Efron, uh, The Minimalists about our lifestyles. Uh, my family are particularly partial to Penguin Town, which is a hilarious docu-soap uh, about the end endangered penguins of South Africa. And we also have children's shows like Arctic Dogs, uh, Izzy's Koala World, of course, the beloved Octonauts, and Bigfoot Family. And so those are green premise titles, but one of the things we're really uh, seeing a, pick, a pickup in are what we call green moments. So these are titles where a subplot or a character trait or a joke um, is written into the script that reflects the reality of a changing climate and also the climate action that we all need to take um, to, to keep that at bay. There's one in the first opening episode of, of the, the world hit Lupin. There are multiple throughout the series, Atypical, Grace and Frankie. Um, and there are subplots and dedicated episodes in Madam Secretary, uh, Queer Eye. And of course, Sweet Tooth is really uh, an allegory for clim young uh, climate activists. So we're excited to support our creative uh, partners as they tell these stories and our content team comes to us every week with the opportunity to do just that. Thank you so much. Um, Stephanie, many of us here are in Los Angeles where it's become routine for the skies to be darkened by forest fire smoke. You're in New York City where in the past few years it's been severely affected by weather and by a raging pandemic. So how do you think that these experiences are gonna translate onto screen? And, and is the cultural footprint of the industry tied to acknowledging these realities? 
That's a great question. I hope that these experiences um, show themselves in storytelling. I was talking with some folks before about how we've just gone through a year and a half of a global pandemic. It's still going on. And I am really surprised at the amount of content that does not show people wearing masks, does not show people uh, physically distancing. Like we are, our, the, the content, the entertainment that we're consuming acts like the, the pandemic doesn't exist. Um, and it's it's so jarring because when it does appear like the, um, I was watching scenes for a marriage, uh, as it starts, we see the behind the scenes and we see the crew in masks, but then the, the actors just walk on the set and, and everybody's acting like the pandemic doesn't happen. And I think that's going to hurt us. I think it's going to, to uh, uh, negatively affect our ability to come out on the other side of this if we ignore uh, things that are happening in front of us and that that this is a cultural moment that I think we can uh, take advantage of. And as storytellers, uh, Emma, that was a great quote that you uh, gave us. As storytellers, we need to encourage people to acknowledge that what we're going through and to, and to model good solutions. Thank you, Louise, on how to um, come out of this that experience. And I, I also to the uh, the climate hotline video earlier, these, these stories don't need to be disaster stories and um, to Fabi's comment earlier, they also don't need to be this aspirational uh, escapist, rather escapist um, kinds of stories. We can have everyday people dealing with uh, these situations in the way that they actually do. And, and I think that will help us as, as a collective, as a community, uh, help get through them and help figure out how to, to um, how to live and, and be good to each other moving forward because because this is only affecting us more and more each year and, it, and it's affecting uh, the global majority uh, of this world even more than it than the, those who have the concentration of resources so um, so I hope it, it will will we will see those stories reflected and I I thank you Emma for sharing all the things that Netflix is is promoting that way I hope the other studios and streamers um, encourage and and finance projects that give us that same content and one quick plug for the green production guide if you go to greenproductionguide.com there's a, a series of of um, links at the top and one of them is a series a video series and the first one I believe was about new climate narratives so it also discussed mm. how we can um, so some stories that are already including climate in their um, storytelling and, and encouraging others to do the same. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's great to know that that resource is already there in existence. Uh, Ruzer, next question for you. Albert's been at the forefront uh, also of these issues with its planet placement editorial resources. Um, we probably aren't going to be able to calculate the uh, and measure the impact of these creative choices we're talking about. But in your view, what are some big systemic solutions that can be embedded into uh, content creation? So we actually can measure it a little bit. So what we what we've done from Albert, if we do every year, it's the third year we do it this year. Uh, it's a report called Subtitles to Save the World, where we try where we count um, we grab from different broadcasters in the UK that's based in the UK only. Uh, how many times we mention climate change, or how many, and of also words related to climate change, like vegetarian, like cycling, like electric cars, etc., like renewable energy. And actually, in 2018, and all these, not counting news programs, or like everything but no news programs, uh, we said that on year one, 2008, we we mentioned climate change 3,000 times only on the full year, compared to mentioning cake, for example, around 40 or 50,000 times. Second year, we went up to 13,600 times. But obviously, last year, because of COVID, probably, we went da back down again, around uh, 12,715 times. So we're still not talking about it enough. Um, one thing that we focus on, Albert, always is on storytelling and being positive and showing the solutions. Uh, and also, most importantly, on introducing that positive content on programs that they not focus on sustainability. So obviously someone who's interested in sustainability is going to watch a documentary, is going to watch a program related to that or related to nature. But for us, the interesting thing is put it on the reality show, put it on the drama production, put it on a comedy, on a panel show. That's where we really need to introduce those conversations and those those solutions. And, and one thing, again, I was saying about positive, but one thing that I've noticed, and that's quite personal, is I do think that we are responsible 
for lots of the actions that we're taking. So someone was mentioning you know, that, that people copies what they see when they see on a screen. And I see that a lot, for example, with my mom, I always uh, say that. Um, so we have actually, I remember my lifetime of watching films or watching, or watching series, uh, how we started introducing in Hollywood, especially um, the way we needed to consume a lot. We needed to run a lot. Like I remember the coffee cups. I'm from, from Spain. We would never run with a coffee cup on the street. We would sit and have a coffee in a bar and then we would go and, and carry on whatever we're doing. And now you see in Spain people running around with coffee cups. And I think that's something that we actually put really on fashion uh, in the Hollywood films and in the Hollywood industry. So as we're responsible for that, I think we should be responsible as well for taking all these off screen, super important, not show unsustainable behavior. So it's not only about showing sustainable behavior, it's first not showing unsustainable behavior, not, not amplifying consumerism, not amplifying all the unsustainable behavior that we've been doing uh, in the last years and start amplifying the good, the good, the good, the good and sustainable behaviors, putting the cool, the cool characters, cycling, talking about, about, oh, I just bought this on a, on a, on a second hand shop. Just like normalizing a uh, behavior that is going to lead us to a, to a sustainable future. Um, Hunter, in your book, you analyze how current divisiveness is pushing some scholars away from taking hard stances. So uh, here's a quote, in, a quote from your book, accepting the post-political turn and reframing their charge as one of the industry ex as one of industry experts and data analysts. So why do you reject this trend? How do you think it's related to the cultural impact that we're discussing right now? Um, I'm really glad y'all brought that up and that you sort of uh, identified that particular quote. I also realized that uh, in my excitement to get to jump into it last time, I forgot to introduce myself. So I will backpedal now and do that first. Uh, I'm Hunter Vaughn. Uh, I'm a queer Caucasian white male. Uh, I have an asymmetrical dark brown hairdo, tortoise shell glasses, and I'm wearing a navy shirt with pink honeybees on it. Um, so to go back to your your question, uh, Chris. So I think that you know there was in the '60s and the '70s film theory and criticism and cultural studies of, of the 80s were very much engaged with the representational politics uh, connected to post-war social movements, such as the feminist movement, the civil rights movement, uh, the, you know, the gay rights movement. And so they were deeply enmeshed in a sort of Marxist approach to the politics of scholarship and theory. And then maybe reflecting just a more general a uh, conservative turn, but also a neoliberal corporatization of universities and academia as, a, as an, an institution. Uh, in the 90s, there was a big shift away from that and towards a more sort of neutral uh, objectivity. And I think this largely also came from, from scholars in the humanities and visual culture studies who wanted to appear more scientific. Um, and, and so they took off the mantle of political engagement and tried to take on more of a, a language of neutrality and, and empiricism. And I think that, that that was a failure, I think, on, on behalf of, of intellectualism and, and academia in general to, to support important uh, social change and, and justice movements uh, for a couple of decades. And now I think that it's becoming more apparent that you know climate change and a potential climate future uh, or, or climate change uh, responses, adaptations and resilience is inseparable from environmental justice and environmental justice issues. And so we can't really talk about climate change or responses to environmental destabilization without also talking about how they're connected to structural inequalities uh, and, and systems of social inequality. And so basically it's 2021. Uh, I, I just think that the time is over for sitting on the fence. And I, I think it's time for academics, researchers, scholars, authors, writers, but also people in the creative industries, filmmakers, showrunners, 
producers, everyone, yeah, it's time to, to take a stance and to become part of, of larger scale cultural value shifts and, and social movements. Thank you so much, Hunter. I couldn't agree more. Um, we're, we're closing out our section on cultural uh, footprint. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that the majority of the people representing this conference are light-skinned, white passing, and white. And that is not the majority of the people who are suffering the most from climate change. And so uh, back to what Fabi talked about in her incredible keynote, one of the things that we have not told the full truth about is we're talking about the kinds of stories that we need to tell in Hollywood is the truth of whiteness and its impact on the climate, uh, the truth of broken treaties, the truth of enslavement and the ways that that enslavement pays for everything that is now negatively impacting the earth. So I think it's really important to continue to focus on that. Let's make sure that next year when y'all do this, there are lots more darker skinned people representing this movement because we know you're out here and we know you're mostly living this um, and living the consequences of all of our behavior. So thank you so much for that portion. We are now going to move into solutions uh, and really talking about what we can actually do. What are some solutions that everyone in the audience and all of us on this panel can implement? Yeah, and talking about solutions, you know, Fanchen, you are you co-created the inclusion writer and i think that we should really acknowledge that because you're not you're not just a moderator here you also have done incredibly important work on this and i think the inclusion writer is is a model that could potentially be applied to a lot of other issues including sustainability so can you tell us a little bit about the process of the Ooh, inclusion writer i'd love to thank you so much and i'll do this quickly because i really want to make sure we've especially got time uh for the q a for open q a but um the uh, inclusion writer i co-wrote the inclusion writer with dr stacy smith at usc annenberg and with kalpana kodegal a badass civil rights attorney at cohen milstein and um we also then recently last year Kalpan and I started working with Color of Change and Dr. Tasman Plater at Endeavor Content to create a, an inclusion writer template that is for companies. So we really shifted our focus from individuals like Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Michael B. Jordan, taking it into their negotiations and actually having companies uh, just implement the writer. And it is, as you said, Chris, it is so connected to what we're talking about because it is very much about collecting data. Um, the first important piece of the inclusion writer is that you deepen and diversify your hiring pool. This is based on the Rooney rule to understand that before you even start hiring, you've got to make sure you're looking at a broader representation of who you're casting and also who you're hiring for crew. And then next, it's setting targets and benchmarks. So we talked a lot about data analysis, uh, collection and analysis, but we haven't talked about the importance of actually then looking at that data and saying, here are the demographics that are not being represented, we are going to commit to hiring folks from these demographics that are not presented both in cast and crew. The next piece is then what we all talked about. Once you've done your hiring, once you've uh, gone into production, perhaps you're in post or in distribution, you are now actually collecting that data, analyzing it, and reporting it out. This is really important for transparency and thank you so much Netflix for what you're doing by sharing this data, that's so important. But here's the piece that I haven't heard anyone talk about and I think it's what really makes the inclusion writer unique is that once you've collected and analyzed that data and reported it out, how are you holding yourself accountable? And the inclusion writer says that what you will do is where you fall short on those targets and benchmarks that you made, you will make meaningful financial contributions to organizations that serve to uplift, for example, cinematographers of color, queer cinematographers, trans writers. There are all these organizations in existence that are here to help deepen the pools for hiring. And so where you fall short, and this is something that I think we absolutely can do for climate change, where you fall short on your goals and targets, what if you 
put money back into making sure that we are staying focused on the work we're doing. So uh, go to inclusionwriter.org for more information, for the templates, for the hiring resources. And uh, thank you so much for having a little bit, giving me a little bit of time to talk about it. And we very much encourage all of you to implement the Inclusion Writer in your work and, and add in, uh, because it's a template, add in climate change to your Inclusion Writer. And we're happy to help guide you in doing that. Okay, uh, so now let's get back to our panelists. Uh, and so my question really is open for everyone, but um, you can go ahead and respond. If you'd like to respond in order, we can go Ruzer, Stephanie, Emma, Hunter, and Louise, but also just jump in. So keeping equity and inclusion in mind, what concrete solutions do you want to highlight as it relates to the industry's environmental and cultural footprint? Let's start with Ruby. Should, should I, should we go? Okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, it's about like showing the reality and acknowledging, acknowledging what we've been doing uh, in the past. So obviously include everybody on this conversation, show everything that we've been doing until now and show how we could all together change it. And, and especially in terms of logistics and operations. So let's, Let's start showing everything. Let's start. Let's start. Let's put the industry out there, every everywhere. So it feels like we are, we are showing what we mentioned, like all the whiteness, and and this is what's happening in the industry. So basically, we need to see all those productions and all this content that is made around the world, and it's not made only in one part of the world. Yeah, and that means behind the screen and in front of the screen. For me, it's really important that we can show films and we can show story uh, storytelling that has sh that connects di get, connect diversity and connects em the environment. And, and that we put it out there and we give voice to absolutely everybody who needs to have the voice and who, who has, has not had the voice uh, until, until now, right until now. Thank you. Uh yeah, I was going to say, uh, just to echo what Roser said, you know, we need to have more voices represented, more people at the table. And it's, you know, um, there's plenty of talent out there. And so, you know, getting those gatekeepers who apparently don't have a vested interest, that those, as, as uh, Fabi said at the beginning, like folks that uh, that didn't want to wear masks in boardrooms, figured out a way for production, for, for their companies to, to not have to worry about the pandemic. And we, we lightning speed got a, a, um, a vaccine. For those folks who wanted to be back in production, they lightning speed got all the unions and guilds who can't make decisions even every three years. Um, they got them together and created a way forward. So, um, you know, putting our money where our mouth is and including more people in those conversations. I think also with our productions, acting more locally, getting people who are actually experiencing um, the the elements, the the the, uh, the effects of climate change, the effects of, of um, environmental injustices everywhere. Like there are people actually living it in the community that you want to have your project. So involve them in the discussion. Also hire them. Uh, in films, we bring in all our resources. We bring in the, the crew. We bring in the, the um, materials, the costumes. We buy props and things from other places. But there are communities that we're stepping into that we're working within that can provide a lot of that if we just uh, take a look. So hiring locally, uh, buying locally, just you know, staying uh, staying locally as much as possible, I think, is, is one way that we can um, just implement some of the things we're talking about. And just, you know, echoing what Rosa said also, just making sure that everyone's involved in that conversation. And I, and I love that we are moving towards accountability. I think as a society, um, we've, we've had a, a huge movement last year that I saw as moving toward accountability. Um, so that and authenticity is another thing that we're seeing more in our storytelling. So let's just keep that going. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, well, I think um, one one thing we could consider as a community is is stop talking about climate as an environmental issue. It's ultimately a humanitarian issue and will exacerbate all of the social inequities um, that could so concern us uh, today. Three weeks ago, uh, in an unprecedented step, 200 medical journals issued a joint statement calling uh, climate change the greatest threat to global public health, uh, doing catastrophic harm 
that will be impossible to reverse and largely as we've talked about and disproportionately affecting communities of color uh, and disadvantaged communities and women. In related news, those are the three communities who report they are most concerned and anxious about climate. So what does that mean? How do we um, envelop uh, that angst and, and channel it for good? One of the things we've been working on internally is a set of guidelines or tips and tricks for how to communicate inclusively around climate. One of the things that the social psychology research suggests is that when people are confronted with something of this magnitude and complexity, our brain actually shuts down. We are actually paralyzed by that. And so we need to find ways to make it really relatable, very accessible, and very personal. It's not about the planet. It's about your children, your neighbors, your church, your football team. Um, and also to uh, choose our messengers wisely. We've done some research to suggest that Actually, climate scientists are the most trusted messengers. And you might note that you don't see them on screen all that much, except for earlier this week when uh, climate scientists took over the, the late night shows. And then a third thing that we like to think about is how to give people agency. Because when people feel that their maybe little action, their individual action doesn't have a ripple effect, they don't bother taking it. It's something called self-efficacy. A notice that uh, my action does have impact. And then we need collective efficacy, meaning there are others doing this and I'm just joining a community of like-minded um, mission-driven uh, people around me. So those are some of the things that we're working on internally. Um, and I do think that this field needs some, some, some reshaking, some reconsidering around who we include and how we do that. Thank you, Hunter and then Louise, please. Uh, I'll try to keep this short. I echo all of those, absolutely. Um, and uh, would probably just build upon transparency and accountability as someone who's on the periphery or outside of the industry itself. I think that those are really important in terms of building public trust uh, between the industry and, and audiences, but also to loop back to something that Stephanie said. Um, I would actually love to see more engagement with local communities in a way that's maybe uh, challenges the, the conventional formats of, of screen texts. Uh, something other than like the two hour feature film or the 43 minute serial or the 30 minute sitcom. Uh, maybe more uh, industry support for participatory media experiments that put cameras and, and narratives and agency into the hands of communities to let them tell their own stories. Uh, maybe more support of short form environmental communication video, which can also be extremely entertaining, engaging and, and educational. Uh, so yeah, I think that, um, again, I, I totally support and agree with everything that's been said up to now. Um, that is one thing that I would add to it. And Louise. Uh, so when I kind of thought concrete solutions, uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about a, a couple of projects that I'm working on with the British Film Commission and Film London, and they are industry-wide infrastructure projects so that we are able to operate in a more sustainable manner. So the first one of which is called the Grid Project, and we are piloting installing electrical cabinets into the most heavily used unit bases across the city of London. Um, powered by completely renewable energy to avoid bringing diesel generators to run our unit bases. So I think the inclusion and community side of that is we are bringing pollution into that local community by running generators to run our trailers and our catering and, and everything else. Um, and there's not another way else to do it. We can't ask productions not to do it at the moment because a solution doesn't exist yet. So we thought, OK, as a city, as a, as a country, this is a way we can solve that problem. If they can just plug in to an electrical cabinet and we know there's a clean supply of energy there, we, we've solved that. And every unit that pulls into those heavily used unit bases can now have clean power, absolutely zero emissions of NOx, SOx, CO2 at site. So that's one of the really exciting things that I think um, is, is cross industry. And we hope that, you know, it will it will go across London and then the other cities and other countries will kind of pick up on that. So, um, and then the other one 
again, infrastructure based with the, the British Film Commission is the stage space strategy. So uh, a production essentially is just, you know, a limited company on paper and a group of people. We hire almost everything. We inhabit empty boxes on stages. So we're looking at how can we make the studio infrastructure itself more sustainable so that when production companies move into those spaces and begin using those spaces, the, the infrastructure around them is guiding them towards sustainability and they can then focus on producing their content and and bringing down the the emissions that we're we're not able to manage from a, an infrastructure basis um so i think yeah that's that's kind of where i'm thinking when i think of concrete solutions thank you so much i think we ended up with some amazing gems uh and we will have information for you and i know there is information throughout the this uh summit for actual solutions, tangible solutions. We're now gonna start our Q&A portion. So Chris, will you please share some of the questions from the audience? Yeah, we've had some really great audience participation that we've been highlighting on screen this whole time. Um, such interesting and, and intelligent viewpoints in there. Um, we have talked a fair amount about ways in which the entertainment industry can highlight positive individual changes. And I think this is a really interesting question from someone in the audience about how can the industry stop glorifying uh, the systems and the industries that are really causing so much of the harm here. So how can, this is for anyone, anyone can jump in on this one. How can the film industry move away from glorifying extractive and destructive industries? And, and this person specifically highlighted things like Gold, you know, the docu series around Gold Rush, Gold Fever, Deadliest Catch, Big Timber, all of the oil, that type of stuff. So, how can we, how can we move away from that? How can we get those to be villains in films rather than heroes? I earlier mentioned Ragnarok. Um, it's my and my team's favorite current example of wonderful entertainment and drama. Um, uh, definitely uh, something you get hooked on. And the villains are um, not even thinly veiled. They're very overtly extracting um, uh, resources from their local community, polluting the water. And meanwhile, the whole backdrop is the melting ice um, behind them. And it makes for such a perfect villain, a bit like in the Bond film where um, the, the villain buys up the world's water. Uh, so it actually is really a source of wonderful um, creative uh, fodder and one that's largely untapped and untold. So I think, you know, in, in large part, as we've talked about, the doom and gloom angle on this has, has been told. So as a creative industry, let's look for the white space. Um, I want to also be very mindful of, uh, of time as I know we're getting towards the end of the program. So um, we're going to ask just a few more questions. Um, one from another audience member from, um, from Susanna, how do we change commercial productions that are extremely fast and wasteful? Uh, there seems to be a disconnect between the film industry and commercial productions. I would say that's true. Personally, I don't work a lot in the, the commercial space. I tend to be in features and, and high end TV. Um, but there is a great program um, by a lady called Joe Coombs called Ad Green um, in the UK. And they are specifically looking at that. And I would I would say from my experience, that would just be planning early. And I know that's difficult with commercials because everything's such short time scales, but um, just everything with the sustainability kind of goggles in mind from day one um would be would be my advice if i could just add to that i think um please <laughs> no if i could just add to that i think you know working commercials and branded content we're, we're usually very short period of time we're we're coming in really quickly and we, we're promoting a brand of some sort and i think as consumers we can um, we can force, as, as we've seen, we can, you know, we can really heavily encourage our brands to be more sustainable. One of the first commercials I worked on was for a company that mandated that we have green production. So that is possible. And, um, and there are lots of ways that commercials can
need to push uh, to have have them uh, act in that responsible way. All right, I think that this is the last question that we're going to have time for. Um, in the real world, emissions cannot be offset. So we will, this is from an audience member, in the real world, emissions cannot be offset. We will overshoot 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming if we rely on neutrality accounting. What would it take to actually remove all emissions from the entire Netflix supply chain? And let's also expand that to all other productions as well. So anyone who wants to can jump in. Yeah, so that's the importance of setting a science-based target first. Um, and what that means is you then put your company on a carbon diet in line with what the climate science says is needed, which is for the world economy to get to net zero by 2050. We've decided to accelerate that to next year. And so in doing that, there's no way we 100% decarbonize our country, our country, our company in one year. So that means that any residual emissions, we've voluntarily decided to buy carbon offsets against and to deeply invest in the communities that benefit locally from those investments. And we're told from some of our project partners in Kenya, for example, that if a branch is broken on the trees in Kasagao, the community elders know about it and you get a phone call because they know that that is their livelihood and they are proud of that natural resource. Those are the sorts of critically important and locally beneficial projects that these carbon credit finance dollars go to and if we don't invest in these nature-based solutions in the near term, I like to say it's like pouring wine into a wine glass with a hole in the bottom. You end up out of money and quite thirsty because right now we're destroying and sometimes even allowing to burn the natural ecosystems that currently regulate the climate. So it's not just about offsetting, it's also about investing in nature. Can I can I just add something just really quick? So for me, it's about not putting those emissions from the first place into the atmosphere. And I think we really, really need to think the way how we've been producing until now. And it really links to equality. So it's about like on your development, which locations, if you go somewhere, are you going to choose? Which, like, why do you have to travel exactly what we were saying before everybody? So it's just like, if you want to, if you want to show another part of the world, show the other part of the world, but let those people show that part of the world. So you're not going to put those emissions into the atmosphere from, from day one. So I think we need to go back to the roots, to the beginning. I like love it from all the Sorry. nods here. I think, uh, that was a wonderful way, sadly, to, to have to end this um, discussion for today. I want to thank the panelists. I have learned so much from you. I can't wait to collaborate with you. This is so important. Um, and so everybody join in and unify on this, on this fight that we have. Uh, and I think, uh, Chris, I don't know if you want to wrap it up and then introduce the next person who's coming on. Yes, the yes. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Fanchen. Thank you for being such a fantastic co-moderator. Thank you to all of the panelists. Um, if you would like to learn, all of the people who are watching, if you'd like to learn how you can take action, please um, visit the Hollywood Climate Summit Action Guide. It's in the Take Action Portal, or you can just go to hcs.earth slash action guide. So, don't just have this be a conversation. Let's actually move it into action. And that guide is a great resource to find all sorts of action items related to sustainable production, climate storytelling, and supporting frontline grassroots organizations. So if you complete any of those items and you share your results via social media, tagging at yeah impact, Y-E-A impact, or using the hashtag climate, Hollywood Climate Summit, you will enter a giveaway for Dr. Catherine Hayhoe's new book, Saving Us, a Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World, who is, by the way, ready to join us right now and tell us more about her work. So please give it up for Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, a climate scientist and chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. She's been named a United Nations Champion of the Earth and one of Time's 100 Most Influential People, and she currently serves as the Climate Ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. Catherine hosts the PBS digital series Global Weirding and has written for the New York Times. Her TED Talk, The Most Important Thing You Can Do to Fight Climate Change, Talk About It, has been viewed over 5 million times. Here is Catherine Hayhoe. Hi, I'm a climate scientist. So I and my colleagues are the reason we know that climate is changing, that humans are responsible. Yes, we really have checked and we are the ones causing the planet to warm and that the impacts are serious. 
Yet every day on social media and in emails and sometimes even letters that people send me, I hear objections. How do you know this thing is real? How do you know it's humans, not a natural cycle or volcanoes? And it isn't bad. There's nothing we need to do about it. These objections are so common, so frequently voiced, that even though we have great answers to all of them, we know it's warming because of thousands of thermometers around the world, ocean boys, satellites, and more. We know it's us because we've carefully checked every other reason, and we know it's bad because the impacts are already here today. Even though we have solid answers to these zombie myths, so to speak, we often think that the problem is people don't know enough science. People need to be more educated. They need to understand more science. But that's not the real problem we have. Because if people truly didn't believe the science of climate change, they wouldn't use stoves or fridges or airplanes either. It's the exact same physics. No, the biggest problem we have is not the gap between people who say it's real and people who say it isn't. The bigger gap that we have, the one that's really preventing us from taking action on this issue, is the gap between those of us who say it's real and those of us who think it affects me. When you survey people across the United States, well over 70% say, yes, climate is changing. It will affect plants and animals, other species, not humans. It will affect future generations. It will affect people who live over there in developing countries, but it won't affect me. That is the biggest gap we have. Because if you say, yes, it's a real problem, but it doesn't really matter to me, why would we ever want to do anything to fix it? Here's the reality, though. Climate change is not only a future issue. It's actually here right now. Climate change is not only affecting people over there. It's affecting us. Climate change doesn't only matter to plants and animals. After the polar bears, we're next. Climate change affects our health. It affects the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, and the water we drink. It affects the safety of our homes. It affects the stability of our economy and our geopolitical systems. Climate change literally affects everything that is already at the top of our priority list today. It isn't a case of saying, oh, well, climate change is number 29 and I need to move it up to maybe number eight or maybe number seven or maybe number two. No, I don't think climate change even needs to be on our priority list at all. And I'm a climate scientist. Yeah, I don't think it needs to be on our priority list at all. Why not? Because the only reason I care about climate change is because of what is already at the top of my list. At the top of my list is my son, because I'm a mom. It's the fact that I want the place where I live to be a safe place to live. I want to know that there's a healthy future for my son and his friends, my nieces and nephews. I want to know that there's still going to be snow in the winter because I love skiing. I want to make sure that there aren't all these invasive species moving in here, bringing pests and diseases that affect our food. And most of all, I want to make sure that the poorest and most vulnerable and most marginalized people right here in North America, as well as on the other side of the world, are not being disproportionately harmed by the impacts of a problem like climate change that they have done almost nothing to cause. I care about climate change because of who I already am. And because of that, who you already are is the perfect person to care as well. Wherever you live, whatever you care about, whatever your abilities or talents or interests, you already care about climate change. And if you don't think you do, you just haven't connected the dots between what's at the top of your list and how climate change is affecting those things. You might be an athlete. You might enjoy food. You might just like going to beaches. In my new book, Saving Us, I talk about how climate change affects every single one of us. And I'm hoping, I think, it's going to be impossible for you to read that book without seeing yourself somewhere and understanding that, hey, yeah, it actually affects something that matters to me. But that's not enough. We have to fix this problem too. And how do we fix it? I'm not going to lie. It's going to take a really big change. It is going to take a system-wide change. Changing our light bulbs, eating more plants, even getting solar panels on our roof, those are all good first steps, but they, those alone are not enough to fix climate change. We need system-wide change. How does that happen? Well, the world has changed before. Slavery, giving women the vote, civil rights. How did the world change back then? 
Was it because a president or a prime minister or a CEO or a celebrity decided it had to? No, it was because ordinary people used their voices to talk about why it mattered, how it was unjust, and how the world could and should be a better place. Every single one of us has a voice. And by using that voice, that is how we can change the world. The power of storytelling is immense. Did you know that neuroscientists tell us that when we listen to somebody tell a story, our brain waves actually synchronize with theirs and we enter into and share often their emotions? Storytelling is so powerful and that's why I'm so excited about this initiative because climate change is not just something that we talk about in nature documentaries, although there's plenty of those that are great. Climate change is something that we can talk about in terms of the future of the human race. It's in the Marvel movies, right? It's in the Kingsman movies. Climate change is in comedies, it's in action movies, it's in kids' cartoons like the Octonauts. Climate change is a human issue that relates to all of us. And so as we tell human stories today, climate change is always there in the background of our stories, both talking about how it affects us, whether it's wildfires burning greater area across the Western US, whether it's bigger, stronger hurricanes inundating cities along the Gulf Coast, whether it's devastating heat waves or longer, stronger droughts, talking about how climate change affects our lives here and now today, but also talking about the solutions, talking about how clean energy brings jobs and cleans up our air and our water talking about how being more efficient and less wasteful with our food and our energy saves us money and allows more to go around. Talking about nature-based solutions, I love those, where we invest in restoring ecosystems, conserving ecosystems, yes, planting trees too, and they suck up carbon out of the atmosphere, they provide habitat for wildlife, and they clean up our air and our water. It's a win, win, win. So when it comes to climate change, we all have a role to play. And that's why I called my book, Saving Us. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Nicholas Svenningsen, and it's really my great pleasure to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts from the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat here in Bonn in Germany about the significance and the potential of the work that you're doing at the Hollywood Climate Summit. My organization, the United Nations Climate Change, was established to help governments to work together to combat the threat of climate change. In 2015, we achieved the Paris Agreement, which is really a blueprint for how government should work together to counter this threat. But today, as we know, climate change is no longer a threat. It is a fact. It is a full-grown crisis going on all around us. In California, in Canada, in Germany, in India, China, Fiji, all over the world, we are seeing more and more frequent and extreme weather events and impacts on ecosystems and on different sectors of society. Business as usual and life as usual is not going to continue if we don't do something about climate change very, very rapidly, very soon. So while we here in the United Nations are mostly working with the governments, we have since the Paris Agreement also realized that governments are not enough. We need all hands on deck. We need cities, we need the private sector, we need civil society, we need individuals like you and me to work together to really change the very dangerous path that we are on. In order to do so, we have started a number of different initiatives for fashion, for sports, for transport, for food, for tourism and others where we are bringing together the stakeholders to really map out how do we walk the talk? How do we move from the world we have today into a climate neutral world? Because that is what science is telling us. If we are going to deal successfully with climate change, we need to have a climate neutral society by the mid of this century. We need to reduce the emissions we have in our society within the next eight years by 50%, no less. It's a very, very hard task. It's hard because we have not done our homework enough in the last 20, 30 years. But now it is crunch time and we need all hands on deck. The Hollywood Climate Summit is bringing together people who are working on the screens. And let me tell you that while the solution to climate change may be in technologies, in policies, in economic instruments, it's also very much about in humans. 
It's about knowledge. It is about education. It is about the influences that you pick up from wherever we go. And something that we have in common, most of us, is that we all enjoy a good film, a good movie, a good TV series. And I'm not saying that we, for that reason, need to make all our TV series and movies about climate change. That would be terrible. I wouldn't like to see all of them. But what I do think is that all of you are working at this in different ways, have a possibility to use the stardom, if you like, the, the brightness of the screen to bring awareness to people inside and outside the studios. I also believe that the film industry, the movie industry and TV industry should walk the talk. It should be a climate neutral industry well before the mid of this century. It is possible, I am convinced, to do a climate neutral movie or TV series already today. Hollywood has always been the inspiring light for many peoples around the world. I would really love to see that Hollywood is also becoming the inspiring light for climate action. And on our side at the UNFCCC, the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat, we will be delighted to work together with all of you. I wish you all a successful summit and look forward to hear about the outcomes. Thank you. Oh, you just caught me reading Hollywood Dirtiest Secrets, The Hidden Environmental Cost of the Movie. You should read it too if you are interested in learning more about the ecological consequences of making and watching content. Visit our action guide at hcs.earth slash action guide if you want to learn more on how you can take action and stick around for some action items presented by some of our YA yeah board members. Amplify the Youth v. Gov impact campaign and the story of the 21 plaintiffs suing the U.S. government for their constitutional right to live. Find out how you can help victims of ongoing climate disasters. Check out the hcs.earth slash action guide to find resources on how climate change and natural disasters are related, where you can donate to, and what you can do to ignite local and systemic action. Support NDN Collective's Land Back Campaign to build lasting Indigenous sovereignty and collective BIPOC liberation. We need more gatherings of industry leaders, artists, and innovators to prioritize sustainability in the media sector. Don't miss the 2021 Sustainable Production Forum from October 25th to the 29th and sign up for the newsletter for updates. Help advance research on how Hollywood's massive use of paper is fueling the climate crisis. Fill out Scriptation's Going Paperless survey to share your insights, promote opt-in paper policies, and make paperless productions the new normal. Sign up for YAS upcoming Climate Ambassadors Network to connect with like-minded professionals in the entertainment industry. Register today at hcs.earth slash can. Donate to Intersectional Environmentalists to fund future AI programming led by BIPOC activists and visit their existing resources if you haven't yet. You can learn more about Climate Interactive and how to run your own inroads simulation at hcs.earth forward slash inroads. Learn more about reducing your carbon footprint and what the future of sustainable filmmaking could be like in Albert's new report, A Screen New Deal. Want to learn more about greening your production? Check out PGA's Green Production Guide for the numerous resources, tools, and vendors available for reducing your environmental impact on set. The PGA Green Toolkit has a carbon footprint calculator and a sustainables practice checklist. It's free and available online at greenproductionguide.com. Water is life. Tell Biden and his administration to stop Line 3 in Minnesota. You can find a list of frontline organizations to support financially at hcs.earth slash action guide, as well as a template to write a letter to the Army Corps of Engineers, Jamie Pinkham. We need to urge the film industry to tell more stories about the climate crisis. Our friends at Fridays for Future LA started a petition and hashtag Hollywood must help. We need thousands of you to take a stand, sign and amplify. Want to learn more about integrating climate storytelling into film? Don't miss the NRDC's Rewrite the Future initiative and their panel at Sundance 2021, Beyond Apocalypse. If you need a dose of optimism, you should read Catherine Hayhoe's new book, Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world. If you share the action guide and tag Yeah Impact, you can get a free copy in our Summit Take Actions giveaway. 
Are you feeling overwhelmed by climate crisis news? You can call the Climate Crisis Hotline at 1833 emo for eco That's 1833 emo for eco if you need a safe, comfortable, non-judgmental space to verbally confront the paralyzing melancholia induced from environmental distress.